into the cultural dimensions of environment, landscape, space and place. Yeah, and that, that uh, involves the interrelation between cultural geography as a subdiscipline, which is obviously in the title of the journal, uh, but also its interdisciplinary connection. So there are lots of people in um, different disciplines dealing with the sorts of themes that we're interested in, of landscape, environment, space, place, mobility, things like that. So um, sociology, cultural studies, history, environmental studies, um, any number of other disciplines that interact with cultural geography, or, um, um, we, we think of ourselves as interdisciplinary in that sense, as long as there's a cultural ge geographical engagement with that. We're interested in empirically engaged and theoretically rich papers that aren't restricted to any particular methodological or theoretical orientation. Yes, there can be. There can be two types of papers, really. I mean, you can have those kinds of theoretically rich papers that um, have a new area of study which um, is involved a considerable amount of empirical research. Um, but as long as they have some kind of also some kind of theoretical input that's driving things forward, um, and some papers are purely th theoretical as well, that are really sort of um, set based on secondary sources or based on th just reading the theoretical literature itself and taking debates forward in the subdiscipline and in, in the interconnections between the subdiscipline and other disciplines. In addition to peer-reviewed articles, the journal also features a cultural geographies in practice section where we publish short papers um, that are editor-reviewed based more generally on um, artistic or policy-based interventions. These can be papers that are uh, by cultural geographers or by people outside of cultural geography that are engaging with cultural geographical ideas and concepts. Yes, and we also have a, a review se section, which is quite important to us. Many journals are losing their book review sections. And uh, the monograph, the book, is a, a very key kind of output for cultural geographers where we're, we're more on that kind of humanity, social science interface. So it's very important that we keep track of um, and, and, it's, and respond to these kinds of things as they come out. And that also includes some review essays where um, uh, um, the, the book review editors will ask someone to look at two or three books perhaps and write an essay uh, involved in those themes if there's some kind of theme that seems to be pressing and uh, emergent within cultural geography. A successful paper in cultural geographies typically starts as a, a roughly 8,000 word manuscript and we like to see papers that advance a new approach to an issue, take theory in a new direction or something where a paper that will significantly further an existing approach to a particular idea or theoretical approach. Um, sometimes we find a truly exemplary empirical case study that, that illustrates how a particular theoretical approach can really, re you know, the, how it really works on the ground. So those are three types of papers that we typically publish. And when an author can articulate clearly how one of those three is accomplished, that typically leads to a successful paper. Yeah. We also, you know, there are also clear unsuccessful submissions to the journal. Um, the most obviously unsuccessful submissions are ones that don't engage with cultural geography, uh, which we get uh, quite a lot of. Um, um, there are also ones which are strictly empirical case studies. So though we do like the exemplary case studies that are, that are that, that, you know, you can almost imagine someone using it in class and saying, this is the example of how to do this, this is, this is the one to look at. Um, we do get case study um, based papers that are simply an empirical report and were unlikely to accept or um, a paper like that. Um, and the other kind of paper that we get that, that may be a very good paper in many ways but we can't really accept interdisciplinary papers that really aren't engaging with the heart of cultural geography or for instance won't have any references to cultural geographers uh, in, the refer in the end notes. Um, uh, that's unlikely to succeed. We are still a subdisciplinary sort of flagship journal in that respect. Well, 
as with the papers that we encourage, I mean, there are two main ways in which we're advancing the subdiscipline. One is um, through substantive uh, empirical research that is, um, is developing and taking forward some of the central ideas in cultural geography and, and sister disciplines. And the other is through um, engaged uh, theoretical um, uh, discussion uh, taking theory forward, maybe maybe finding new ways of thinking about things people have written about before, but also engaging with um, a variety of writers uh, within cultural geography and certainly in a large scope of the humanities and social sciences philosophy uh, beyond it to say something that it might it might say to us. But I think that we're trying to do two things. One is one is to take in, as it were, ideas from elsewhere to develop our subdiscipline. The other is to export our subdiscipline to say, you know, we've got something to tell other people. So we want the exemplary kinds of papers, um, so that say someone in um, in sociology or someone in, in history or someone in environmental science even might look at and say, this is why cultural geography should be important to us as well as the other way around. I think that's very important. And one of the ways in which we do that, in addition to the articles that we publish in the journal, is we host annually at the Association of American Geographers Conference in the United States, a Cultural Geography's annual lecture. So this is a featured plenary lecture at the conference, and each year we invite um, a prominent geographer to speak and to, uh, as in a real benchmark way, to set an agenda and move an agenda forward for cultural geography. And that paper is then published in the journal in order to, in order to really facilitate advancing those debates. Well, the journal has a very interesting history because it marks a particular moment in the development of the discipline of geography as a whole, and cultural geography in particular, which was um, around about the late 1980s when cultural geography uh, was something that had a long tradition in the US and in, in North America in general, and not much of a tradition in Britain, in fact, hardly anyone called themselves a cultural geographer in the 1980s. Um, but it was British geographers and a few people in North America started to shake up the discipline um, with reference to other disciplines, so that was why the interdisciplinary thing is important. So people engaged with cultural studies, people engaged with um, art theory, literary theory, um, um, developments in philosophy, particularly in continental philosophy, uh, in order to develop what became called the new cultural geography, um, which sort of blossomed in the late 80s. And by the early 90s, this, this sub-discipline, or this new approach to cultural geography, which was more theoretically astute, perhaps, than older versions of cultural geography, um, uh, had reached a point where it needed a voice. So we, it already had a few key textbooks, um, or, or introductory kind of books about it. And Dennis Cosgrove, who was at Royal Holloway uh, University of London at the time, and uh, James Duncan, who was at Syracuse, um, decided to get together and start uh, what was then called ecumeny, uh, which was a, a, a play on words that, um, that uh, involved environment, culture and meaning, which are still very much things at the heart of the journal. So that started in, um, in 1993, so we're approaching our 20th anniversary next year. And Tim and I um, carry on that tradition um, from the original editors. In, in the UK, editors have been Dennis Cosgrove, then Phil Krang, and then Tim in the, in the United States, it went from Jim Duncan to, to, at Syracuse to Don Mitchell, uh, also at Syracuse University, to Mona Domash at Dartmouth, and then to myself at Louisiana State University. And because of that history, because it was sort of there at the beginning, I mean, we like to think of the, the, the journal as a kind of, um, a kind of uh, a landmark in, the, in, in cultural geography. It's an important moment when it started, and it still has that position as a, um, a kind of... Uh, benchmark journal for cultural geography, I think. We're supported by a terrific editorial team. In addition to the two of us, the Cultural Geographies in Practice section also has two editors, Hayden Larmer at the University of Glasgow and Deb Thien at Cal State University Long Beach. The Book Review section also has two editors, Pete Merriman at Aberystwyth University and Scott Kirsch at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. We also have an editorial board of 25 people who um, represent uh, expertise across a range of themes within cultural geography, such as, um, for instance, political ecology or the nature environment side of the work, or something on the other side, which is more to do with the arts and creativity, or perhaps iconography and landscape. And uh, that's refreshed every now and then, so people leave and people arrive, and we try and keep up with them, um, uh, whatever the emerging themes are within the discipline, by, rep by them representing us on the editorial board, and we can call upon them then to look at particular papers in their field. 
And finally, we have an advisory board, an international advisory board of, of uh, the great and good of people across disciplines. Uh, these might be historians, philosophers, people in literary studies, and, uh, and, and across the world as well, so they're international. And we can call upon them for strategic advice and, and for occasional kind of um, uh, sense of where the journal's going from someone outside of the process so they can tell us about it. Uh, as we mentioned in terms of the history of the journal, the journal arose at this moment uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, when cultural geography was going through this enormous transformation. So uh, cultural geography before then, or before, say, the mid-1980s, was very much a North American tradition, and it was concerned with um, the spatial distribution of cultural things, essentially. Um, things meaning objects in the sense of um, uh, buildings or... Um, uh, or something like that, but also things in the sense of more abstract ideas like place names or uh, uh, agricultural kinds of ways of doing things. Um, what the journal represents is this break in cultural geography. So in, um, it's a break and a continuity, to be fair, uh, in, the, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, when sort of theoretical impetus from a number of different places, cultural studies in Britain, um, literary theory, uh, post-structural philosophy, for instance, and Marxism to some degree, all of these started to sort of uh, churn around in cultural geography, and, and cultural geography became uh, a slightly different kettle of fish from what it was before. So now, um, uh, 20 years after that, cultural geography uh, it has settled down and become a, a very uh, important part of the discipline of geography as a whole. Um, one, of the, one of the places where theor theoretical ideas become uh, come into the discipline, uh, so that the, the cultural geography then starts to inform other sub-disciplines like economic geography or political geography, and so it started to seep out of the sub-discipline and become something uh, all-encompassing all in many ways. And what, what's at the heart of it, I think, is this. Um, it's a relationship between something we call culture, which we, have to, we can put aside and we can debate what that is, and something uh, called geography, which uh, in includes a whole number of different central things like place, space, landscape, uh, journeys, environment, um, nature, or the body. All of these are kind of um, uh, themes within geography. And then what we try and work out is how those things relate to this thing called culture, which itself includes a number of different things, such as uh, meaning, uh, representation, that world, but also the things we do which may not be conscious all the time, that um, has most recently uh, seen a revival in terms of non-representational theory, which is a body of work that is at the heart of cultural geography now and developing new ways of thinking about it. And, um, and th that relationship can go two ways. So the relationship can either be uh, how culture uh, produces, reproduces, maintains, or transforms geographies, so how something like um, um, uh, a set of meanings in a form of representation that could be medicine, or it could be planning, or it could be architecture, or it could be comedy, it could be any number of things, how those, um, those uh, uh, meanings and practices transform things like place, space, landscape, mobility, the body, and the other way around. So how the fact of geography, and geography is very, very important. I mean, geography has all these concepts that are really central to um, what it is to be human. So, you know, you can't think of a world without place, even though any particular place is a social construct, there will always be some, uh, or space, or territory, or any of these things are there, and they're, they're very fundamental to the way we are. And these are all always having their effects on meaning and practice. Um, and so, so what cultural geography is, is about this juggling, this relationship, and, and trying, to, trying to work out at what points in particular empirical uh, uh, case studies, in times and places, at what points um, these things are influencing each other and precisely how they're doing it. And so a lot of the theoretical discussion is around, um, well, you know, what is doing most work here? Is it the set of representations that might be in um, uh, some, anything from science to, to art? Or, or is it um, practices, the things people are doing, um, it may, may not be conscious and may not be um, written down or represented in any particular way, or is it in fact the other way around? Is it, is it, um, is it uh, uh, something like a place having some power uh, in and of itself, producing effects in the world of, um, of representation and the world of practice, make, uh, causing certain kinds of meanings to emerge or causing certain kinds of practices uh, to become adopted or to become dominant or, uh, in particular ways? And finally, Beyond all of that, there is this idea that, um, that all of this is always being struggled over. So there's a politics to cultural geography. 
Uh, it isn't as though uh, someone comes down and matches one thing onto another, some powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing person, but that um, it's constantly being struggled over. People are always um, contesting these relationships and transforming them all the time. Mm -hmm.